two years ago, sort of towards the beginning or middle of the COVID uh, pandemic, I was making a lot of videos talking about vaccines, talking about uh, RNA, because my background is in genetics and I studied RNA and RNA silencing. So it felt like one area where I could contribute my expertise. And I got a comment on one of my videos that said, you're using words like maybe and likely, which means you don't know when I was in school, science had answers. And it really made me think about the language that we use in science to represent uncertainty, because it is so incredibly important in science to accurately use words like likely, maybe, rarely. We never say something as a 100% chance. We never say something as a 0% chance. We use these words to be as truthful and complete as possible but when they translate out to the outside world, who's not as comfortable using these words in day-to-day -day conversation, it makes it sound like scientists don't know. It makes it sound like this level of uncertainty is incredibly risky. So it led me down this path of really investigating and reading and studying why we use the words we use in science and what we can do to continue to be accurate in our presentation of science, but also not scare the public into sort of misinformation around these words. So I'll dive into that uh, in a second. I do wanna start first by telling you a little bit about how I got to here. So that was a very lovely introduction and I appreciate it, but my true path came from indecision that I graduated from college in 2011 and I had double majored in biology and film and I felt like I had to pick one. I either had to stay a scientist or I had to become a filmmaker and I had gotten a really great hands-on lab experience in my undergraduate degree. And I knew I wanted to go on and do a PhD, but I decided to take a couple years to actually work in film to get a more hands-on film experience. So I did that for a couple years at a lovely small production company uh, in Massachusetts. And at the time, I started a YouTube channel. And this was absolutely just a hobby because I missed talking about science. I was sort of fulfilling that creative portion of myself during my day job, but I miss talking about science. So I made a YouTube channel back in 2012 uh, at a time where YouTube was very different from what it was now, just as a hobby, just to have fun and make some videos. I didn't think anyone would actually watch them, but it turns out some people did. And I got some incredible opportunities because of that. I got to talk to cool people, go to cool places, but it really was just a hobby. It was a side thing. I got to talk about science online. I then went back to graduate school. Uh, I knew I loved science. I knew I loved research. I also knew I didn't want to be a professor, but I knew that graduate school was a great way to learn more about science and think more deeply about what it was that I was interested in. And this is a post-it that I kept above my desk for almost all of my graduate career that I'm here to learn. It's okay not to know everything. It's okay to still be figuring things out, but as long as I was learning, that was okay. And I did learn a lot in graduate school. This is me at my actual lab bench doing science. <clears throat> I studied uh, cardiovascular genetics, really, really enjoyed it. But now at this point in time, it felt like the science side of me was being fulfilled, but the creative side was missing a little bit. So I kept making YouTube videos now to really satisfy that creative side. And again, got to do some really cool things. And this was one of my favorite videos I've ever made where I got to interview astronaut Kate Rubens, who was the first person to sequence DNA in space. And I got to go down to NASA and sequence DNA with her and talk with her. And this remains one of the coolest days I've ever had. Uh, she is a rock star and doing just such fantastic things. But this video uh, was seen by a small biotech company. They asked me if I would make videos professionally, and I'd never really considered that this kind of thing could be a career. This was just something that I did for fun. But they asked me if I would be willing to make some science communication videos for them, and I did, and they became my first freelance client. Um, and so I'm freelancing on the side, I'm defending my PhD, this is me defending my PhD thesis, and I can't believe now that 2018 was six years ago, uh, this was me wrapping up my project. And then I went on and said, okay, I'm gonna give myself a year to try and do science communication full time. You know, I have a couple freelance clients now. Um, one of them is pictured over on the left, the Genes in Space program, that little uh, machine I'm holding had actually just come back from space. So they do a lot of really cool space science and biology communication. 
Um, I was lucky enough on the right to be a Jackson Wild Media Lab fellow where I would absolutely recommend, it is open to international applicants, that if you're interested in science filmmaking as well, uh, the Jackson Wild Media Lab is an incredible two week sort of boot camp in everything science filmmaking. Um, and again, absolutely open to international applicants. So if that's something you're interested in, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, and so now I have been working as a professional science communicator for six full years, which again is crazy that this is my full time job. And it's split really between sort of four things. So I have some corporate clients where I am producing maybe more marketing type videos for them, a bit more sort of standard things. I am producing. So last year I produced a series for PBS Digital Studios. I wasn't on camera at all. I was directing and show running and behind the camera and doing all of those kinds of things and trying to really get the ideas out there. Uh, I do write and host a lot of videos for places like the American Chemical Society, the Boston Museum of Science. Uh, and then I also get to do workshops like this. And this is really one of my favorite things is being able to talk about science communication with other people who are passionate about it. So I love that that also gets to be a part of my job. So I think the thing that unites all four of these sort of quadrants of what I do is that it is all about asking good questions. And for me, uh, grad school is a great way to sort of learn that in a bit of a crash course. But I think this is something you can learn in a thousand different ways, that science is about asking good questions. It's about looking at the data that's there, formulating a new question, and then figuring out how do I track down the right people to help me with this? How do I track down where the answers are? How do I design an experiment to answer this question? And I think science communication is very similar. It is looking at the data. It is looking at the science. It is asking, who do I want to communicate this to? And why do I want to communicate it to them? And what do I want them to do with that? And then figuring out how to answer those questions. So I really think that the basis of good science and good science communication is all about questions. So. I wanna talk about three things in this talk today. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about why we communicate science. You know, I think you all are part of this cohort, so you are already motivated to do it, but I wanna talk a little bit about why it is so important to communicate science and communicate it well. I then wanna talk again about that uncertain language that we use in science and why it is so important. And then I wanna talk about merging those two things together. So we have to communicate science we want to be accurate and use that language of uncertainty that is so central to science. But how do we do that in a way that people are receptive to and can really sort of understand in a way that's useful for them? And I do want to leave a little bit of time for questions at the end, too. So we'll get we'll get a little time for that. So for me, again, my Ph.D. is in genetics. I think about genetics topics a lot. So this is where a lot of my examples come from. And so I think that when I started doing science communication, it was for fun, right? It was a hobby. It was something I enjoyed. But the more I did it, the more I realized how poorly, honestly, genetics had already been communicated to the public and how big of a gap there was in what people were being asked to make decisions about and what they had been equipped to make decisions about. So I think we're seeing questions all the time about genetics in medical testing, right? Your doctor might be asking if you want a genetic test. We're seeing non-GMO labels pop up on food in the grocery stores. We're seeing news stories about things like genome editing. We're seeing successful stories of people having diseases resolved by CRISPR. I think we're encountering genetics more and more in our daily lives, but at least in the US, which again is where sort of my, you know, biggest focus on the education system is, we have not equipped people to be prepared to make those decisions in a way that they feel ready to. So there's all kinds of these big societal and ethical issues that are coming up in genetics that not only affect us personally, but I think we're going to have to make decisions at, at a societal level and at a global level. And so the example I often give is uh, a story that, again, now happened five or six years ago, of the scientist uh, He Zhang Kui in China, who announced at a conference that he had edited the genomes of two babies in utero. And this was something that he had not told anyone that the scientific community had sort of said we didn't want to do. We weren't going to do uh, germline genome editing yet. He did it with essentially no outside guidance. He 
it was shown afterwards, uh, did not fill out appropriate consent forms, did not appropriately tell the patients what he was really doing. Um, this was a huge deal. He ended up going to jail for it in China for a few years because of the different ethical lines that he had crossed. This was huge. This was the first time that someone had publicly admitted that they had used CRISPR to edit uh, embryos. And I asked, this to me was like groundbreaking news. And I asked my Instagram audience the next day, who is already a scientifically inclined audience, if they had just seen a headline about this. And almost half of them had not. This was an audience who, again, is scientifically inclined. They had not even heard that this had happened. And this to me was un upsetting because we are going to be asked, I think, at a societal level, at a global level in the next few years, if this is something we wanna do, how we wanna draw boundaries around this. You know, the technology is there that we can now edit embryos is this something as humanity that we wanna do? And that's a question, I think that's a very extreme example, but all kinds of things about, you know, medical genome testing, medical uh, CRISPR editing, that we're gonna have to make decisions about of what we find okay and what we don't find okay. And I do not believe that only doctors and politicians should make these decisions. I think everyone should be making these decisions. We should have patients involved, caregivers involved, family members involved, but all of those people need to feel that they are ready to participate in that conversation. So it's very important to me that we equip the public with the best scientific knowledge so that no matter what decision they make, they are making it with all of the information and they can make an informed decision. That's very important to me. And so this is a story uh, or a study that came out uh, a few years ago as well that I thought did a really nice job of talking about how we need to communicate genetic and genomic information. And this quote in here was, uh, I think, telling to me that in order for the translation of genomic information to improve medicine and public health, individuals will need to be able to understand the information provided to them and use that information to make health decisions and participate in policy discussions. And this paper talks a lot about that. And they also make the point that the public is often familiar with these scientific terms. They might've heard the term CRISPR, they might've heard the term gene editing, but they're often unfamiliar with what that means, with the underlying science and mechanisms. But so that they can make these health decisions and make public pol policy decisions, it's really important that we as science communicators can help give them that information. And I wanna to note too that these issues extend beyond just medicine and research. So this was a study done of US adults asking whether or not they found it acceptable for DNA testing companies, places like 23andMe and Ancestry DNA to share users' genetic data with law enforcement. So there have been a number of big cases uh, over the past few years of cold murder cases, you know, cold crime cases that have been solved now by excuse me, law enforcement essentially submitting DNA samples they didn't have matches for to these kinds of databases and figuring out where they are in a family tree and then finding uh, the suspect. And about 50% of people said that it was okay for DNA testing companies to do that. And again, I'm not saying which is right. I am not the person to decide that. We all have to decide that. But people are split almost 50-50 between whether or not this is or isn't okay. And I think we need to get in either direction to more of a majority um, before we start letting these kinds of things happen, before we start saying, yes, this is okay, or no, this isn't okay as a society. The other thing that I think is really important to note is that public stories about science can have really big impacts on people's lives. So again, almost a decade ago now, maybe a little over a decade ago now, Angelina Jolie came out in a Time Magazine uh, or came out in an article that was then covered by Time Magazine and talked about the fact that she had a genetic mutation that predisposed her to breast cancer and that she had made the decision to have a double mastectomy as a preventative treatment against getting breast cancer. So this story came out and then afterwards, uh, I'd love you to try and think about where this story might have happened by a spike in data. So on the bottom, we have years. So this is time. And on the y-axis, we have uh, genetic mutation testing per 100,000 women. And right here is where that story came out. There was a dramatic increase around 2013 in women going to their doctors and asking for this test 
because they had seen the story about Angelina Jolie and wanted to take control of their own health. And so, again, there have been countless articles on both sides about whether or not this was a good thing, whether or not it was a bad thing, what happened. But no matter where you fall on that about whether this was a good or bad thing, it clearly had an effect. Her talking about this publicly, a big public story about genetics led to people taking action about their own health. <clears throat> and this happened again in a smaller way. Uh, in 2022, uh, Chris Hemsworth, who's an actor in the Thor movies, came out and talked about the fact that he had learned that he had a genetic mutation that predisposed him to Alzheimer's disease. And he talked in an article about how he was making different decisions around his health now and around his career. He wanted to spend more time with his family, take advantage of different things in his life. And I went and looked on Google Trends right after this happened, and there was a spike in searches uh, later that day in both searches for genetic testing and a big spike in searches for APOE4. Uh, there was also here a giant spike in searches for Chris Hemsworth. It was too big. It overwhelmed the graph. I took it out. But even on these sort of smaller stories, this story wasn't as big as the Angelina Jolie story, but it still got people asking questions about what is APOE4, what is this gene? And it got people asking questions about genetic testing and what it might mean for their health. And so I wanna make sure as a genetics communicator that when they do those uh, searches, they find good information. That's really important to me. Now, beyond just things being important for uh, public knowledge and people being able to make good decisions for themselves and their own health. As scientists, it is important that the sci that the public is interested and knowledgeable about science because it can impact our funding. So these are not the most beautiful uh, data visualizations, but there are two graphs here. On the left, we're looking at people's scientific knowledge, and on the right, we're looking at people's scientific interest. And the uh, y-axis is how much they think, it's people who think we're spending too little on science research. So the higher you are up, the more you think we should be spending more money. And in both of these graphs, if people have more scientific knowledge and if they have more scientific interest, they think we should be better funding science research. So even if you're a scientist, and I don't think anyone in this cohort is, but sometimes I talk to scientists who are like, I don't care, I don't wanna communicate. And I'm like, well, that's fine, but it impacts your funding. It really impacts you know, your science, whether or not it's something you wanna do. And similarly, again, a lot of my examples come from genetics, and these are two examples of places uh, in the US where geneticists have really messed up. So on the right uh, is Henrietta Lacks, who I think is a very common story of a woman whose cells were taken without her knowledge, propagated in the lab, became the backbone of a lot of scientific research, but she was a black woman in America in the early 1900s, and she did not consent to this process. Her family was not compensated for this process. They didn't even know that this had happened. Um, and she was really taken advantage of and rightfully led a lot of the black community to be fearful of participating in scientific research because they didn't know what was happening in their samples and they didn't know that they would actually benefit from the research. On the left, uh, there's an indigenous tribe, the Havasupai, who had samples taken by the University of Arizona. This was more recent, this was maybe in the 80s and 90s, that their samples were taken and they were told that their DNA samples were gonna be taken to be used for diabetes research. Along the way, their samples were used for other research that they did not consent to and that they were not happy about. And they ended up suing the University of Arizona and trying to get their data back. And this is, unfortunately just one of many examples where indigenous tribes in the u.s have had their samples taken used for things they didn't want used in research they did not consent to and again it has made uh marginalized communities in many places but especially in the united states feel that they don't want to participate in scientific research absolutely understandably if you have been historically mistreated you are not going to want to continue to participate in this research and what that means for science is that this is a whole bunch of you know uh people and communities that we are not including in our research and so not only does that mean that our research isn't complete it also means that our data and our results don't always then benefit these communities so it's kind of an awful cycle that if you're not communicating what you are trying to do 
you end up losing trust and then you end up losing the ability to incorporate everybody and every community into scientific research. And again, that's, you know, if you want to be a cold hearted scientist, it means you're losing out on data. But if you want to be a more kind person, it also means that the results of your data aren't translatable to everybody. And that's, I think, something we all would hope for. So I think hopefully we're all on the same page about why we want to communicate science and why it is important to communicate science. Uh, but there are some pitfalls to that. There are some places where things can go a little wrong. And one of them is this language that we use, this uncertain language. So the language of uncertainty is critical in science. And I think this is the clearest example is that we're all sitting here right now on a Zoom call. I could tell you right now that you are not going to be struck by lightning on your walk home. It is wildly improbable that during this call, you're going to be struck by lightning, right? But I can't tell you that with 100% certainty. I don't know where all of you are. One of you could be sitting in a field in the middle of a thunderstorm, right? Like it is wildly improbable that this is going to happen. But I can't tell you for 100% certainty because I can't predict the future. So we use this kind of language in science. We use this language of uncertainty to uh, encompass that, right? But I can be pretty sure. However, you know, using that uncertain language acknowledges that science is a process and not a set of facts. So science is not something that is set in stone. We are always, as scientists, updating our understanding. And that is incredibly important. That is part of the process of science, is changing our minds when there's new data that comes out, is updating our theories, updating our hypotheses, trying new things. And that is a good thing in science, but it doesn't mean that we're not certain in what we already have. It just leaves room for more questions, more hypotheses, and more knowledge. And it also acknowledges that we rarely prove anything in science. That was one of the first things that uh, one of my professors in college told me about science. He was, he was like, you never prove anything. You can show a lot of data. You can disprove something, but you can never prove it. You know, we just don't do that. And that's, I think, both true and also a cultural part of science because without uncertainty science legitimacy and reputation would be at stake if i told you all right now you are not going to get struck by lightning during this call but then one of you did you would never trust me again right like you would not trust what i was saying even though i'm so certain it's not going to happen i have to leave that room for possibility because we are humans we have a finite knowledge of you know, the natural world, we are constantly improving that knowledge through science, we're constantly improving things, but we are human, we are incomplete in our knowledge, we will always be incomplete in our knowledge. That's what science is, is striving to have more. So that uncertainty is critical in how we talk about science, and we do it commonly with each other. And scientists to scientists, we understand what we mean. You understand what I mean when I say it's likely you're not going to get struck by lightning. But that idea puts into somebody else's mind, well, wait, why are you saying I won't be? What? Why are you saying it's unlikely? Like, does that mean it could be likely? Does that mean it could happen? It just seeds this little bit of confusion and it leaves room for possibility. Now, the other thing that I thought was really interesting when I started looking into this is that we're using that language less and less in our scientific publications. So there was a study that came out last year that looked at uh, 2,600 research articles in the journal Science between 1997 and 2021. And they searched for these terms of uncertainty. They searched for terms like could, approximately, seem, likely, maybe. And they looked at how often they appeared in articles along that timeline. And they found that the usage of those words had dropped by half. So in 1997, there were 115 instances of those words for every 10,000 words in a paper. And in 2021, there were only 67 usages of those words. And there were a number of reasons why they thought this might be true. One of the biggest ones was that uh, science publishing has gotten more competitive. And so they thought that perhaps using fewer of these hedging words made them sound more certain and made their results sound like they might want to be published in a journal like Science. They might have a better uh, chance of that. Um, but it's a little concerning. It's a little concerning that this is language that we're 
very tied to in science, that is tied to proper science communication, and it's decreasing. I think that, you know, part of that might be we're trying to get published in higher level journals. I think part of it too might be the sort of pushback from the public that why are you using these words? Don't you know? You know, science has answers. Why don't you have answers? The other thing I thought is interesting is people have done studies. So these are uh, a couple of brothers, the Mabusians, who study probabilistic expressions. So again, these are the words like likely, maybe, rarely. And they wanted to know what percentage people thought that actually meant. So if I say that something is likely, does that mean that it's 51% likely it's going to happen? Or does that mean it's 90% likely it's going to happen? What do people actually hear when you use these words? What does the majority hear when you use these words? So they set up the survey, and that is a survey that, uh, I mean, I'm going to ruin the results for you, so you probably shouldn't take it afterwards, but I think it's really interesting to dive into. It's at probabilitysurvey.com. This is still an open survey. You can put in your data and information. You can go through this list of words and say, I don't know, yeah, if someone says the word likely, I think it's 90%, right? So it's open, and it asks you what you think the values are for all of these different things, and it adds those answers to the data set. Uh, but I am about to ruin it in the next slide, so I apologize. So when they did this, I'm showing you a selection of their results from almost 2,000 people. Uh, they were able to get percentages for each of these words. So when somebody uses the term likely, uh, we have the box and whiskers plot over on the left, the majority of people think that's 70% likely, which I found to be fascinating because if I say that a uh, scientific result is likely, in my mind, I'm thinking it's like 95%, right? But people hear about 70%. And they did this for all of these words. And I just think it's fascinating to sort of look at this, that if you say almost always, people think, okay, it's like 90%. If you say rarely, people think it's, you know, 10%, but more often than not is really sort of a, just a little above 50%, probably is sort of in that 50 to 70%. So I thought this was really fascinating and really useful to me as I think about using these words of what does it mean when I'm, or what do people hear when I say usually versus probably versus often, you know, how do those words change and differ, I thought was just really interesting. And I think as science writers, as science communicators, it's important for us to be thinking about how these words are received, not just how we intend them. I think that's very important because so much of communication is not your intention, but how your words are received. And that's really important. And there was another study that came out, uh, a really interesting one, that was just thinking about how certain people felt different fields of science were. So the x-axis here is increasing precision in science. And this is not real. This is just what people think is more precise or more uh, certain science on the right and less certain science on the left. And I thought this was really fascinating that, okay, psychology is over on the left. I guess that makes some sense that that feels a little uncertain. Evolution is almost all the way over on the left side of this graph. The general public, and again, this is a US audience, but they did split it across uh, sort of the political spectrum. So this is an average across the political spectrum. People thought evolution was really imprecise, which was surprising to me. And then all the way over on the right is forensic science, which to me is one of the most imprecise sciences. You know, things like blood spatter analysis and, uh, you know, thread count analysis and all this can be good, but like fingerprints and lie detector tests, so many of those have been kind of discredited over the years, but because they show up in media so often and they're on so many shows as here is your smart scientist in the lab figuring out the crime with forensic science, people think it's incredibly certain. So this too, to me, was fascinating to think about how people perceive just different aspects of science. And I, again, was a little sad that genetic engineering is sort of like, you know, a third of the way through this graph where I'm like, no, we know what we're doing. Of course, there's uncertainty, but we we really know what we're doing. Um, so this study was interesting. Uh, they, however, found, and this I thought was very important for science communicators, that these overarching field levels of 
people's perception of how precise a certain science field was does influence their idea of how beneficial it is to society and how much we should be funding it. However, it did not translate to specific results of specific studies. So if you are talking about an evolution study, even though people might think that the overall field is not very precise, you can convince them that a specific study is precise. So this too, I thought was really important as we think about communicating science, that even though there are some of these overarching uh, perceptions of fields, we can overcome that by talking about specific studies and specific results. So I think doing that in our communication whenever possible is very important. I did though look into a study uh, about specifically misinformation and uncertainty online during COVID. And this was looking at Weibo, which is a Chinese social media platform. And they were looking at the spread of misinformation after uncertain statements had been made. And the specific statements that they were studying in this case were around whether or not pets could spread COVID-19. And the the data got a little murky, but the there were two statements. One was the actual evidence statement that a dog, a dog, had tested weekly positive for COVID. That was the actual piece of evidence. Um, and people then reported it as, so maybe dogs could pass on COVID-19. But then the information spread as dogs can uh, pass on COVID-19, which was not what the original information had said, but someone, you know, this uncertain language about like, oh, this is a thing we should investigate had been interpreted uh, wrongly as misinformation and certainty. So the study did some really interesting analyses of how this misinformation had spread online. And they said that the uncertainty circulating around preliminary evidence, this kind of thing, can promote the generation and transmission of misinformation inferred from the evidence. So they found uh, clear evidence that during things like COVID-19, where data is co was coming out daily, right? And people were desperate for data. And so we were looking at preprints and bioarchive papers and small shreds of evidence. The uncertainty around that small evidence and that preliminary evidence was not understood by the public as preliminary evidence. It was understood by the public in the way that we typically talk about scientific studies, which is at the end and at the consensus, even though there's never an end to science, we talk about it sort of at a consensus level. And that's what people were hearing, even though we were talking about preliminary evidence. So they said that users endorsing the misinformation in posts received more likes and reposts than those rejecting the misinformation. And this, I think, is something that we see over and over and has been shown in the data over and over that negative stories that uh, stories that elicit negative emotions, so things like fear, anger, and disgust, get more likes, more shares, more reposts and spread more quickly on social media. So if you have two posts, one that says dogs could maybe spread COVID-19, that is something that elicits fear, right? You get worried. You start worrying about like, is this something I need to be concerned about in my daily lives versus a post that says dogs don't spread COVID. That's not a good story. It doesn't really elicit any uh, strong emotions. And so it just doesn't get as much shares. So I think this is something we need to think about as well as how do we make sure that we are tamping down on those negative emotions in misinformation posts and elevating good emotions in uh, information posts. The other thing that I thought was, again, just reiterating what I think we probably all know, but they finally had data to back it up. They said that our study suggests that health policymakers should regulate the hasty communication of emerging evidence during a novel health crisis. And authorities should be better using uh, Weibo-like social media to communicate scientific consensus rather than uncertainty about the emerging evidence. And this is one of those things that I, I think is hard to do, right? Because we know that social media does not work, that there is one source of information that everybody goes to. Anyone can post anything on social media, whether it is true or not. And I think that's a great thing, honestly. I think that it helps with the spread of information. It helps make sure that we have diverse news sources, but it does mean that I think it 
raises the bar for us as communicators of good science to make sure that we are rising above the noise of the misinformation. Because there's no way that we could turn off that pipeline right at the beginning of COVID of people desperately wanting data. People were worried, they wanted information. And I think it is good that science communicators were trying to provide that information. But I think when we do that, we need to be really, really careful about how we're doing it and what information we're sharing. Because at these critical points in communicating, excuse me, misinformation can spread wildly and even small mistakes can sort of grow out of proportion. So how do we do that? How do we take preliminary evidence, science in progress, and use that language of uncertainty, but actually use it in a way that teaches people that this is good, that that uncertainty is a positive part of science without scaring them and without being misinterpreted. So the first thing I wanna talk about, and I talk about this in almost every communication talk I give because it is central to how I communicate and how I think is really important to communicate is knowing your age. So A-G-E, it stands for audience, goal, and environment. And this is something that I did not come up with. I learned this uh, when I was in the oral communication program at Stanford, but it has changed the way that I communicate. So the idea here is that you need to know these three things before you do any kind of communication, before you put pen to paper to write something, before I opened up PowerPoint to try and you know put together this talk, all of this, I need to know these three things. So the first is audience. You want to think about who you are talking to. So you're going to give a different talk if you are talking to a cohort of science writers versus if you're talking to a group of middle schoolers versus if you're talking to a bunch of policymakers, right? You're going to use different language. You are going to assume that they have different background information coming in. So identifying what background information your audience already has and what they don't that you're gonna need to provide to them is critically important. Knowing your audience also helps define your tone. So you're going to speak very differently if you are giving a presentation, you know, to uh, a government body and you're, you know, wearing a suit in, you know, parliament kind of thing versus if you're talking to a class of middle schoolers, right? You want to be more relatable in that second thing. So knowing your audience is very important. You also really want to know the goal of your communication. So sometimes it is as simple as you are relaying information. A new study has come out, people need to know it, you're putting that forward. But often, I think more often, your goal is a bit more complex. You are trying to change somebody's mind on something, or you are trying to give them tools they can use in their daily life, or you're trying to ask them a question, you're trying to make them consider something about their life. But I think knowing what your goal is and being very clear about it, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, um, and being intentional about it helps guide whatever it is you're working on. Because you want to make sure that every sentence you write, every slide you put together, every frame of your film supports that goal. And if it doesn't, you got to cut it because that's going to cut out the excess and really streamline the story you're working on. And finally, I think environment is really important. And again, this can be if you're giving a talk you know, you're going to have different resources depending on the environment. I knew today that we were going to be on Google Meet and that I could use slides. So I prepared slides. If I was going to be in a classroom that I was going to give a chalk talk, I'd give a very different talk kind of thing. I think if you are writing, you want to think about your environment as the placement of that piece of writing. Is it going to be in a newspaper that people might just be flipping by as they're skimming? Is it going to be in a newsletter that someone is getting directly in their inbox? You get to catch them with that title to make sure they open that email. I think knowing where your piece of writing is going to end up also helps you craft it to have the best success in that location. So this is my example of this. Uh, this is a research paper that came out uh, almost about two years ago now, or maybe early 2023, so about a year ago now. Um, and First, it was just a research paper. So flexible tool set transport in Goffin's cockatoos. They were looking at how birds used tools. I know nothing about cockatoos, but I was not the audience for this paper. So their audience writing it in this paper was for other bird scientists. So they could assume they had some background knowledge about the birds. They could assume they probably knew what a Goffin's cockatoo was. Um, their goal was to communicate the findings of their research and their environment was a journal. And as we all know, journal articles have a very set template. You need the introduction, you need materials and methods, that you need the data, like it is a set template. And so if you're going to write 
for that environment, for that journal, you have to follow that template. So this is the first way that this story was presented. It was then picked up by the New York Times. So this is a different audience. This is not an audience of other scientists. This is maybe science enthusiasts. This is maybe people who are interested in learning more about the world around them, but they were not people who could come into this with a background knowledge of how birds use tools. The goal was still to translate the sort of cool science information, but I think also to encourage people to think about the kinds of studies that are being done. Why are we studying these kinds of, why are we studying tool use in birds? What does it mean for the world? Uh, and the environment, right? It was going to be both in an online newspaper, but also in a newspaper. So it had a very different setup. Instead of starting, you know, here we have the introduction of tool innovations are a prime repository for the evolution of technology across species. It's like very formal. Whereas in the New York Times article, cockatoos contain contradictions. They behave like gremlins, said Antonio Usana Mascaro. So it's a very different format. It's a very different way of hooking in an audience. They're thinking about different things for their audience. They have a different goal. It's presented in a different way. And it also made it to other places. So on the right, we have the New York Times tweeting it out. So again, different environment. You only got 140 characters. You need to make it small. There's a picture to grab people in. Um, the line here is, imagine a toddler with pliers in their head, which is just a terrifying image. You know, you can imagine some pliers in a toddler head, but okay, it's very descriptive. It really grabs that audience who might go read this paper. On the left was new scientists who did a TikTok about it. So again, very different format, very different audience here, right? These are people who are scrolling, who may or may not be interested in science, who probably are just gonna stop because, whoa, a bird doing a cool thing. So the same story presented in different environments to different audiences has different needs and you're gonna format it in a different way. I have been talking about this idea of audience goals and environment for years, and then read this book, which came out in the past year, Strategic Science Communication. If I can only recommend one science communication book, it is this book. This is one of the best books. I think the best book I have ever read on science communication. And they do a really deep breakdown on not just the audience and the environment, but on the goals. And this is where I think they do an incredible job of breaking it down that they don't just talk about goals, they talk about goals, objectives, and tactics. And so briefly, uh, their idea of goals are really high level things. So behaviors and acceptances. So they want, your goal might be to influence people to make a health decision. Your goal might be to influence people to vote in a specific way. To do that, you have objectives. And so typically to get someone to make these decisions, you need to change their beliefs. You need to change their feelings. So they really separate out goals and objectives into two different things. Goals are what people are gonna do. Objectives are much more about how they're gonna feel. And you're often trying to do both. And the way you're trying to do both is through the tactics. And those tactics are really what we were talking about today. It's your tone, it's your source, it's your message content, it's all of that. But it is thinking of those tactics in the broader scope of these goals and objectives. And they do an incredible job. I actually, I don't have it on my desk right now, but it is one of my most highlighted books. They do an incredible job of breaking this down. So truly, I would recommend this to all of you to read because I think they do a better deep dive into goals and objectives than I could ever do in an hour um, and really made me change the way I think about what the goals of my communication are. So highly recommend that book. Another thing that we can do when we're thinking about communicating science is just think about the words you and we. So this is another study uh, done by Zach Tormala at the Stanford Business School. He's done a lot of studies into how people receive messages and how people are uh, understanding things both in the language of uncertainty and in just general receptance, uh, receptiveness. And their study found that if you use you statements, so like, you need to go to the doctor. People are less receptive to those messages and they see them as much more aggressive versus if you use language that says, we all need to go to the doctor. That is seen uh, as much, people are more receptive to that. Uh, those messages are less likely to be censored. They're less likely to be sort of taken out of broader communication and people are much more likely to engage with the message source. So I think this is really important when we are putting science 
ideas into context to be using we language versus you language because it's true right like sometimes as writers we feel like we need to divorce ourselves from our writing that we need to be very impartial and just talk about the audience but it's not true we are a part of our communication and i think generalizing results and actions as we language versus you language only benefits the people who are listening the other thing that we can do and this is also from zach tormalo's lab uh is use questions so this study looked at people who were put into a dialogue and they were made to sort of debate someone else and they looked at how questions impacted their uh willingness to change their mind and willingness to be receptive to their debate partner and people who were asked questions by their debate partner favored their debate partner more favorably or they found their debate partner like more receptive they were more willing to engage with them in the future and they acted in a more receptive manner so if you're trying to change somebody's mind on something asking them questions is an effective way to get them to engage with you similarly if people were encouraged to uh, come up with questions themselves they also felt those benefits of feeling like the person that they were uh, engaged with was they felt more positive about the person they were feeling engaged with so both if you ask questions and if you encourage your debate partner to ask you questions it fuels the positive interactions around that uh debate which is incredibly important if we're trying to change people's minds about things and so this is my second suggested reading book uh i also found this book to be fascinating the other one is my favorite if you only read run read the other one but if you have time to read two books this book really changed my mind a lot about how we structure conversations with people who might not be naturally receptive to our messages so people who maybe are anti-vaccine people who don't believe in science um, and it talks a lot about a strategy called deep canvassing which is a way that uh before political elections people will go around and really use structured interviews where they are sharing stories and sharing their own experiences or other people's personal experiences to elicit these questions and get people changing minds so i think it's important to always remember we are in a dialogue with our audience we are not just telling them facts even if it is a written piece of writing encouraging them to ask their own questions about this is a great way to get them to be more receptive to you so when we're thinking about doing that uh, in communicating uncertainty and risk, there are guidelines about that. So the Montauk guidance for communicating risk uh, was from a, a series of people who came together to talk about risk and uncertainty around climate change. So this was a number of experts who came together in a uh, seminar session to talk about the best way to do this. And I think, there's a lot of great stuff in here, but the points that I think relate the most to uncertainty, because they did talk about uncertainty and that were helpful, is to use natural frequencies and avoid single event probabilities, relative frequencies and percents. So using things like this happens weekly versus this happens 25% of the month or something is easier for people to understand. So it is hard naturally for us to understand 70% versus 68% versus 72% using word examples more than number examples is easier for people to understand the risk saying that we think a giant hurricane is going to happen once a year is more effective than using a numerical value um they also found that uncertainty is often interpreted as worst case so again if i say it's unlikely that you're going to be struck by lightning you're only going to hear that there's a chance that you're going to be struck by lightning so people immediately go to that worst case scenario so uh if you do have to give a number um those exact values are perceived as less risky as variable so i know these sound a little contradictory but the idea is that if you can give a like word thing like weekly that's the best but if you have to use something like likely it is useful to then add a percentage to that um and finally they said that it's really important that risk cannot be divorced from choice if you are going to be talking to people about risk you have to give them something to do about it 
So if you're going to be talking about the fact that you have a 70% chance of developing this disease, you also have to tell them what they can do about it. It is incredibly important to add that kind of information in. That helps modulate that uncertainty. Other things that people have found, it's important to acknowledge it. It is really important for us as scientists to say why we are using this uncertain language. You shouldn't just say why you're using the word likely. You should talk about uh, the parameters around it, the reasons why you're using that language. We should be talking to the public about why this language is so critical to science and why we use it and what it means and what it doesn't mean. Um, and again, people reiterate, what can the audience do? What can people do with that risk information, with that uncertain information in their lives? Giving that to people helps with the, uh, helps stop the spread of that misinformation and helps them feel better about that uncertainty. Um, and finally, there's an entire book called The Uncertainty Handbook that came out from a discussion of climate change researchers. Again, Climate change is where a lot of this research has been done because we've been communicating about the risks of climate change for a while. Um, and they have three, they have a bunch of things they talk about, but three main things that really come out. One is to focus on what we know. If you are going to talk about uncertainty in something, it's also important to balance it with things that we are certain about. So if we don't know exactly how many hurricanes are going to happen each year, but we do know that hurricanes are going to happen, it's important to talk about that. Um, it's also really important to emphasize consensus. I think for a very long time, media has wanted to show both sides of the debate. And we know that for things like climate change, both sides of the debate are not as large and are not as valid. It is really important to emphasize the consensus and where most scientists fall. Um, it's also important when you can to use both words and graphics. So it is a lot easier for people to understand where something falls, where 80% falls if you show them a graph versus if you just say the number. It's really easier for people if you see a bell curve to know what it means of an odds ratio that you're two times more likely. What does that mean? How do most people fall in the middle of this bell curve and you know something is out here on the outlier? Using words and graphics when you can is incredibly helpful in showing uh, this uncertainty. So we only have five minutes left. Um, and I did want to leave some time for questions. So we talked about a lot today. I do just want to remind you briefly, you're already a science communicator. If you are a scientist, if you've participated at all in science, you've had to give talks, you've had to give presentations, you've had to write papers, you have to communicate your science every single day. And it's important to do that. Uh, so learning all these skills is important. Um, be a part of conversations. This is how we engage people is getting on the ground, both as a scientific community and person to person. When we have conversations, we need to start from places of genuine appreciation and shared values. This is from Catherine Hayhoe, who again is a climate science communicator who does a great job of this. Um, there are uh, lots of great resources. Sciline is a great one. They send out tip sheets for uh, science communicators, which can be helpful. Um, and again, I don't, I don't want to take up all the time just talking. Um, the final thing I want to say before I let you ask questions uh, is please reach out to me. I've had people from the last cohort reach out, connect on LinkedIn, ask questions. I know that science communication can be a weird world to navigate. So anytime I can help, I love to. So my contact information is here. Please find me, link up on LinkedIn. I'm happy to talk at any time. Uh, and with that, I will stop talking because um, clearly I'm talking too much. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, in the remaining time that we have. Thank you so much, Alex. That was such an amazing session. Uh, I mean, it's a good thing we have the recording because there are so many points that I'm just noting down. I'll go back and watch it again. Thank you so much. We still have, uh, like, I, we can have like 10 minutes for questions, so no, no problem. Uh, and anybody who has a question, feel free to raise their hands or uh, drop it in the in the comments. In the meantime, I'd like to ask the first question if I can. So you're talking about, uh, you know, uncertainty in communicating science. But what happens if somebody is linking that uncertainty to credibility? So, for example, in my personal experience, sometimes when I'm reading something that somebody saying, oh, it's unlikely to happen, I'll immediately think, I mean, I don't know if it's natural or something that, okay, maybe they're not that credible, like they're not that sure of what they're saying. So how can we navigate that as both as readers and as writers? Yes. So I think uh, I'll start with as writers first. 
So I think there are two things we can do. One is, again, address that uncertainty up front and talk about why we're using that uncertain language, because I think that this is sort of a culture shift we have to have, um, is to talk, get people used to the fact that science is uncertain, that we are asking these questions, that that is an important part of science. So I think one of it is right up front, be like, yeah, I'm saying this is unlikely and this is why I'm saying it. Um, the other thing is to also do your best to establish credibility first. So there was a study from Zach Tramala's lab that I didn't include here that I thought was really fascinating that said that people actually trusted experts' opinions more when they were uncertain. And they did this using uh, food reviews. So they made up all these fake food reviews and they said that one was from a food writer and one was from someone who had just like been to the restaurant kind of thing. And when the food writers said more uncertain things, um, they were taken more seriously and people trusted their uh, opinions more, not necessarily their facts, but trusted their opinions more because they were showing like, hey, I'm not perfect. I thought this was great, but I felt a little uncertain on this kind of thing. I wasn't sure what I thought about this. By establishing that credibility up front, people were more willing to take their uncertain opinions. So I think establishing this as a culture shift that we're going to start talking about uncertainty in science and why it's important and then also establishing your expertise up front and that's why you're using those uncertain words can actually move people's sentiment um as a listener i think it is important to just sort of always investigate where we're using these things more because now that i've said it you're going to see this language even more often in science communication and i think starting to recognize as a reader and a listener why am I reacting that way? What does that mean to me? I think that's only going to help um, our writing as well, because I've tried to do it now. I've tried to focus in on these words when I see them in communication, and I find it's helping me and how I use them, too. Um, I did just see a question come in. Uh, yeah, the biggest challenges that you face in ensuring credibility in the world of social media and how do you combat misinformation? That could be a whole nother uh, hour-long talk. I mean, it's funny, I did so much of this COVID communication and I have a PhD in genetics. You know, I studied this for years. I think I am not the most credible person in the world on genetics, but I'm pretty far up there, right? Like I have more, I'm not credible on everything, but I'm credible on that. Like that is the thing that I did a lot of study in. And there were so many people who were arguing with me over basic science facts, over people who were like, no, that's not what RNA is gonna do. And it was so frustrating because I was like, I I think I'm right. Like, I really feel like I am an expert in this and I think I'm right. And I think part of that is coming at it with empathy, right? It's being able to come at it and say, hey, I hear where you're coming from that you know, there's a lot of confusing information out there. I also am a person who is concerned about these things. And here's the study I have done and why, you know, I feel confident in what I am saying. I think it is easy in those cases where someone is questioning your cred credibility to become defensive and to be like, no, 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 I know better. But I know personally, no one has ever changed my mind by telling me I'm stupid or by telling me that they're smarter than I am. People have changed my mind by being empathetic and trying to communicate with me. So I think that's where, you know, it is so easy to be like, I'm more credible because I have this background, because I did this study. I think it is important to communicate that in an empathetic way. That is one way I think is helpful to do that. Um, Combating misinformation, again, is with empathy. There's a uh, suggestion or there's a, a comment that I didn't show in this where I went back and forth with someone who kept telling me RNA was going to overwrite our DNA and that's what transcription means. And I was like, no, transcription means that. And just we went back and forth over and over. And I think, again, coming at it with empathy, it's hard. It's really hard, especially when it feels like the other person does not have that empathy. And when so many people who are spreading misinformation use that certain language. People who are spreading misinformation say, I know with 100% certainty that this supplement is gonna cure your hair loss, right? It's hard. That's what people wanna hear. They wanna hear that certainty. It's really hard to combat that. But I think empathy is really the way to combat both of those things is to relate to people, to ask those questions and to just sort of communicate with them on a human level. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I've noted down all the books you've suggested. 
I'm so glad. Uh, if you could tell me any genetics papers uh, and would love to be involved in genetic engineering. So more suggestions regarding books and papers. Yes, the book I always recommend to people. Uh, oh, I think I moved it to the other room. So there is a book on genetics by Jennifer Doudna and one of her graduate students that was written before she got the Nobel Prize called uh, A Crack in Creation. No, not A Crack in Creation. Yes, A Crack in Creation. Uh, that's the other one. So it's called A Crack in Creation. It technically is talking about CRISPR, but to get there, they do an incredible deep dive on genetics. It is, for me, it is the book I recommend to everyone about how do you get interested in genetics, um, you know, from the basics. Absolutely, A Crack in Creation by Jennifer Doudna. And then the next one I would recommend is a book called The Gene uh, by Siddhartha mm -hmm. Mukherjee. An incredible, incredible, uh, I'd say the next book after you read A Crack in Creation is to read The Gene. Um, is a really, really great book that I think lays out so much of not just the science of genetics, but also the history of it. So those would be my two recommendations for books to read to get into genetics. I loved both of them. Uh, I see that Khatija has raised her hand. Yes. Please do share your question, Khatija. Yes. yes. Uh, am I audible, Dr. Alex? Yes. Okay, first of all, it was really nice to hear your talk, especially with uh, all the genetics examples and um, all, the, all the stories, because uh, I, I have a background in genetics. I just graduated uh, oh, this year. And thank you. I've been doing my uh, master's in genetics as well. Amazing. So, um, yeah, so you shared a graph in, in your presentation which showed that, you know, um, certain um, fields of science are more uh, are perceived to be more credible and some of them are perceived to be less credible. And genetic engineering was on the uh, on the other side where it shouldn't be. Yes. <laughs> so uh, my my thing is like, even though um, it is a newer field of science, science, but in the last 20 years, we've made a lot of progress. And we are at a point where I genuinely believe that genetics is the future of medicine and uh, we're going to be using it even more. So how do you, like, can you suggest me, uh, how can I as a geneticist in the future and even now uh, better communicate it with everyone? And uh, if you have any suggestions or what can we can, can we do to actually, you know, make people understand and love it more like we do? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. This is, it's a great question because again, this is what I think about all the time as a geneticist too, is I'm like, this is the best, it's not the best science. There's no best science, but like it's the science I love best and I think is the coolest. And I want people to understand that too. I think using correct and appropriate language and communicating as much as possible. So as you just said, you know, genetics has changed so much in the past 20 years and i think that what we're taught in school is from like 30 years ago so i think communicating 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 talking to the people around you writing articles talking about the things that we are doing now and how we've gained this additional information um and i think also using correct language this is one of those things that bugs me about the way that genetics is talked about in the media is people who say like oh well you know this like Angelina Jolie had the gene for breast cancer. That drives me nuts, right? Because like we all have the BRCA gene, we just have different alleles of it and different versions of it. And this is something that I see come up all the time. And I think that that kind of idea that our genetics are yes, no answers, that our genetics are, some of us have some genes and some of us have other genes. It just leads to this fundamental misunderstanding that I think means that people can't totally appreciate all of the progress we've made in the past few years. So for me, my my career would be done. I would be feel like it was complete if everyone just knew the difference between a gene and an allele. That to me would mean, okay, I've done my job. I can go home. I never have to do science communication again. I don't think we're ever going to get there. Um, but I think using that correct language and equipping people with that language and getting them used to it. That's the best we can do. And as someone who's actively studying genetics, I would just encourage you to talk to people, talk to people as much as possible and show them who a geneticist is, what you are doing and why it is important. I think also just talk about how cool it is. I think sometimes people don't want to talk about how cool their science is. They want to be very like fact-based. You know, I was giving a workshop a few years ago where a woman was like, I have trouble communicating my science because it's very niche. And I was like, okay, well, why do you find it cool? And she launched into this like grant, like talk about like, well, if you study the genetics of these two flowers and this one, did you do? And I was like, no, no, no. Why do you think it's cool? And I really had to press her before she was like, 
well, sometimes you get a field that has some yellow flowers and some white flowers, and we don't know why. And I was like, great, that's why it's cool. That's the thing that you should be communicating. So I think even in genetics, which is such a heavy topic, like talking about why you think it's cool and why you think those advances are important just at that human level is gonna be huge. So I would encourage you to do that as much as possible. Um, another question around this, I can get the ambiguity around genetics research, how it's constantly evolving. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, yes, please do connect later. Uh, I actually, so, you know, I wrote a couple papers in grad school as part of my research. The one that I am most proud of was a uh, review article that I wrote for a uh, doctor audience. So it was in like cardiovascular genetics. It was like, you know, the age of precision medicine and cardiovascular. I don't remember the exact title of it. It was a while ago, but like precision medicine is in the age of cardiovascular something. Um, but it was breaking down at that time. I mean, now it's like eight years old. It's out of date at this point, but it was breaking down how to use genetics in the clinic and what it can mean for, oh, thank you for finding that. I was like, I don't remember the exact title anymore. Um, that was one of the things I was most proud of because I was able to take what we were doing in genetics and try and translate it to a doctor audience to help them uh, be able to understand these things and use these things in the clinic. So as a junior doctor, uh, I hope that this paper is also helpful. Yes, thank you. Cardiovascular precision medicine in the genomics era. Such a mouthful of a title. All right, does anybody else have any more questions? Um, if not, we'll end the session. And Alex, if, it, if you can just share these slides uh, yes. for, for the people to go over this later. All right. Um, okay. Thank you so much once again uh, for such an informative and enlightening session. I learned so much today and I'm hoping to implement these things myself. And I hope that our uh, cohort participants are also going to implement this. So, yeah. Hopefully, we'll see you in the next cohort, Alex. <laughs> I, I would be happy to. Thank you again for having me. It's always lovely to talk with this group. Uh, and best of luck on the rest of your internship. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for joining. See you next week. Bye-bye.